Welcome back to the second ever episode of Merriweather's World. I am your host, Dr. Mark Merriweather Vorderbruggen, broadcasting live from our dining room. Uh, I may be joined later tonight by co-hosts of other family members as they sneak by trying to get from one side of the house to the other. And we already have people. Hey, Tina. Hey, Stephanie. Hey, Sarah. Hey, Laura. Cool. We got people. Um, wow. So last week seemed to be a raging success. We had, we, I, had almost 7,000 viewers watch this video for at least 30 seconds. All right. Um, Uh-oh. Someone has eyes. <laughs> okay. So tonight uh, we're going to do something a little different. Last week we just had kind of an open question and answer. Ask me anything and I will try and give you some sort of reasonable answer. Tonight we will be uh, doing a special presentation on edible landscaping a number of the plants ideally for the Texas Hill Country. That being said, the nice thing about landscaping plants is if you have the right soil amendments and the right water, you can kind of get them going anywhere. So that is good. A um, couple of other words. Uh, I'm trying to decide if with questions, depending on how we want to get through this, if I just want to limit it to three questions per plant or just let it roll and go with it. Hey, Kiri. Um, I guess we'll see if, if this ends up being a multi-week show, all the better for me because it's less content I have to generate overall. Also, I want to mention that we will just be talking about the edible parts of the plant uh, we won't be talking about medicinal parts of these plants specifically so I have, you know, more material for other shows. So, you know, thinking ahead. All right. Oh, Julie and David. David's back. Hello, David, Amanda, uh, Mai, Kiri, Jody, Christy, Dawn, uh, Stephanie, hey, Shannon Payne, Julie. Wow, there's lots of people here. Cool. Last week at this time we had was a two people. Uh, this week we have a lot more. Uh, another uh, quick bit of news. Uh, this week I don't have an official sponsor, so the sponsor will actually be me. And then specifically, wow, well, I, again, I don't know how the weather, oh, there we go. Okay, so this is my Amazon store where the books and stuff that I mentioned tonight can be bought there. And if you buy things through this link, I get about 6% of the purchase price. Uh, and the average month, that allows me to buy a pizza. Pretty awesome. Okay, so let's talk about edible landscaping. But to do that, I have to bring up the context of this. Uh, so, you know, anyone that's taken my classes know I'm kind of a storyteller. So sit back, grab your drink, uh, and let me tell you a story. Going back to the wee yacht years of Merriweather, the reason I do all this is actually a large part due to food security, making sure there is food around. I got this from my parents. Both of them were children of the Great Depression. And one of the ways the small farming communities through the Minnesota where I grew up got through that terrible time was through their knowledge of wild edible plants. My mom hates the fact that I teach these classes. She's horribly embarrassed by it, uh, mainly because to her, that's just waving the uh, we were poor growing up flag. Uh, so be it. She has that, you know, that right to be that way. Um, but one of the things in our household uh, is there was always lots of food stored. Up in Minnesota, the growing season wasn't all that long, so we did have a big garden. Dad planted a bunch of different fruit trees, and we were constantly canning and jelling and jamming and freezing and storing food um, just because there were times growing up when they didn't have it. Um, like I said, that left a certain impression on me and led to the whole, really, creation of Foraging Texas. So food security. Why is that a big deal? Well, if you read the news, look at the news, however you get your news sources, you realize things are a little crazy right now. 
And one thing that can help you reduce the craziness in your life is not having to worry about where your next meal is coming from. And that's all fine and good if you have money and money is accepted. But in the case of you know, zombie apocalypse or some other equally entertaining, though probably not as entertaining as I would hope, sort of event, um, it's good to have food hidden, hidden around your, your, your domicile. Oh, I like that word. I'm going to use that some more. So, yeah. So with edible landscaping, no one necessarily needs to know you have food. Hey, more people. Davy Jones. Hello, Davy Jones. Davy Jones is a nationally syndicated uh, cartoonist. Very cool. I really got to work on this. Okay. And Wayne Walker and Keith. Cool. Oh, hey, David Polison. Excellent guy. He did a lot of work on my house, but he's actually really cool uh, besides all the multiple skills he has. But I digress. Uh, so let's talk about edible landscaping. And first thing I have to do is give a shout out. Look at this, two cameras to Ellen Zakos. And hopefully she is on here tonight. She said she was going to try. This is a, there's a whole background network of foragers. And quite frankly, she wrote the book on backyard foraging, AKA edible landscaping. Her book is available from Amazon, from my Amazon store. It's a fascinating book. Most of the plants in here will grow in the Texas area and up in the hill country. Like I said, it really depends mostly on water and um, soil amendments. Excellent book. Oh, and just as a side note, that's not the only book Ellen wrote. Also near and dear to my heart is the Wild Crafted Cocktail, basically turning wild plants into <laughs> drinks. Okay, so kudos to Ellen Zakos and her multi-talented book selection. So with no further ado because i think i've already wasted seven minutes let's move on to the presentation your secret garden surprisingly edible and drinkable landscaping plants for the texas hill country all right so this is going to be a uh talking about trees bushes flowers and other things that you can hide in your yard and eat as necessary so let's start well, oops sorry Okay, let's start with trees. And this is a lovely picture of a tree for those of you new to the whole plant thing. Just kidding. Okay, redbud. You may have seen in the springtime in the hill country and, and frankly, lots of other places in the, uh, you know, around Texas. And I just realized I'm, there we go. Okay, that's having a hard time seeing people, but I'm back. Okay, so the red bud. This is the tree that in the spring, late winter, early spring, is covered with purple flowers. Uh, very tiny, no leaves, actually. And whoops, it jumped ahead. The edible part on here are the flowers, and later on, the very young pea pods. So the easiest way, oh, hey, Joan, hey, Joan, uh, Jonathan. The easiest way to eat the flower uh, buds is simply pick them off the tree and put them in your mouth. If you're not opposed to doing dishes, you can add them to a salad. Uh, right now, edible salad dishes made out of uh, tortillas are the best thing ever for people like me who don't like doing dishes. The more of my plate and silverware I can eat, the happier I am. So you can eat the young flowers uh, right off the tree. They're best when they've opened. When they're still closed, they will look like uh, little chilies from the, the Chili's restaurant uh, emblem thing. Uh, they're a little bit bitter then. You want the flower to open up. At that point, they're really, really good. And then after the flower comes the flower or the, the seed pods. They look like tiny peas and you can treat them like tiny peas. Now, the trick is to get them when they're still young and tender. Uh, the best thing to do, uh, really, I tell people, is look for them when they're really no longer, whoops, uh, than your thumbnail. And uh, if you bite into them, they don't have a chalky flavor and they're not stringy. So as long as they're tender, you're good to go with them. Now, you can pretty much wipe the tree clean of the, the seed pods because this is a landscaping plant and it really doesn't reproduce by, uh, by seeds. So go ahead and take it. Now, the nice thing about the red bud seed, uh, seed pods, the little peas, 
or that you can also freeze them for later use. Just pretend you are freezing a real pea where you blanch it first for one minute in boiling water, take it off, ice it down, put it in your freezer, you're good to go. Okay, so looking through the questions, I don't see uh, any questions about red buds. Uh, so let's move on. The bottle brush tree. Now the bottle brush tree is not native to Texas. Uh, Don came up with a question. Are seed pods at all useful once mature? No, the uh, mature seeds are too bitter and there's no real way of making them patable. Um, so just uh, leave them on the tree. There may be other animals that will take them, things like that. Okay, any other questions on the red bud? Nope, okay. Moving on to the bottle brush. Oh, wait. There's a question, Marilyn, can you can them like peas? I would suspect so. The bottle brush uh, peas, sorry, the uh, red bud uh, pea pods, you could probably can. Really, you can treat them like any sort of pea. Okay, moving on to the bottle brush tree. Nope, moving on. I got to, there's too many buttons here. Okay, bottle brush trees. This is actually uh, an Australian tree that's become very common for landscaping here in Texas. Uh, if you've ever smelled the flowers or the crushed leaves, you would realize they are uh, extremely fragrant. Sorry. And so the main use for the flowers and the leaves of the bottle brush tree are as a tea to drink, like an iced tea. Uh, you can also use them uh, as a seasoning for meat. There's no real good way to describe the flavor of bottle brush. Kind of minty, kind of wintergreeny, kind of really extreme would be the flavor I would describe it as. So uh, the tea, again, the leaves, let them dry for several weeks and then crush them up and add them and make a really fragrant, like a somewhat minty, like minty extra sort of, of flavor tea. Or again, if you want to add this sort of flavor to other things uh, meat lamb some fish dishes chicken it goes well with things of that nature so in this case you're using it as a seasoning which makes otherwise less appetizing food actually taste pretty good like if all you have are bags and bags of rice after a while the bottle brush will be a really good source of seasoning for that rice these can grow in sun. They grow quite well up in the hill country area. Um, there is a small problem with them escaping into the wild, but at this point, uh, I have not seen many of them. Okay, uh, looking at the, the questions, is there nothing about the bottle brush? Now, there is a time lag, so that could be part of the issue. Um, but let's move on. Okay, oak. Hopefully you all recognize oak trees. There's a whole bunch of different types of oaks around. And the main thing you are after with the oak tree in the case of food is the acorn. Now, acorns are kind of interesting in that they have been a food source for uh, humans for millennia. There's you know, they, they are an excellent source of food. They're loaded with calories. They're loaded with fat. They're loaded with oil. So there's uh, lots of things that you can do with the acorns. But if you've ever actually tried eating an acorn right off the tree, uh, you can run into a problem that they're very, very bitter. Oh, quick question. Kevin Rust, how far north can bo uh, bottle brush stand? Uh, in my drive in the summer between Minnesota and Texas, well, Texas up to Minnesota, I've seen them up into, you know, mid-continent, really. Again, it, it really depends on the microenvironment, but even Oklahoma and so forth, um, you can get them up there. Oh, yes, as uh, Nick Ree says, if you're, all you're eating are snails and bugs and slugs, some bottle brush tree will probably help. Okay, uh, let us move to the acorns. So the acorns, like I said, if you've ever tried eating one right off the tree, they're really, really bitter and not so pleasant. So 
There's a trick though. The acorns are loaded with a chemical called tannic acid. And if you think about the word tannic acid related to tanning leather, the tannic acid is one of the key chemicals that was used to tan leather, which is just another reason why you probably don't want to consume it. But, ah, I need to stop doing that. Okay, so how do you get rid of the tannic acid? Well, luckily, tannic acid is very, very water soluble. And what the early humankind found was if you crush up the acorn meat, you know, take it out of the shell, crush it up, put it in a woven bag or container and drop it in a stream for a day or two, the water will flush out the tannic acid from the acorn. And at that point, then it'll actually be fairly sweet and quite tasty. Nowadays, most of you probably don't have a freshwater stream where you, know, you feel comfortable soaking your food in it for two, three days. So society has come up with a couple of, hey, it's Ellen, hey, Ellen. Sorry, I'm back. I'm just really excited that Ellen Zakos joined. Ellen Zakos from the book. Okay, so uh, back to leaching acorns. Uh, Yule Gibbons, if you know, remember him, he was a famous wild foods guy from the 70s. Uh, he used to take a piece of pipe with a bunch of holes drilled in it, pack it with the uh, crushed up acorns, put a little screen on the bottom, hang it from a sink, and run water through it all night long. And that would do a good job at removing the, uh, the tannic acid. The issue, especially up in the hill country, and depending on the weather we're having, if we're in a drought condition or something, you probably don't want your you know, tap water running all night long. So if you're really environmentally friendly, what you do is you hang it in the back tank of your toilet, and every time you flush the toilet, fresh water runs over your acorns. I am not that environmentally friendly. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not going to eat food that I've stored in my toilet. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, uh, not my choice. My particular choice is actually Mr. Coffee, where instead of coffee grounds, I just fill the basket up with the chopped up uh, acorn meat, make the pieces you know, pretty small, but not fine. You don't want to powder. You don't want to clog the filter. You want the fluid to pass through. And then you just start making pot after pot after ta of uh, tannic water. Now, the trick with that is uh, you need to keep the reservoir water hot. If you like start it going and walk away and you know, the thing runs and then the acorn meat cools down, uh, the acorn meat will shrink some and it becomes harder to draw the rest of the tannic acid out. So you have to be kind of waiting there with boiling water to refill the reservoir as quickly as possible after dumping out the, the coffee. Now, when you do that, the first couple of uh, washes that you get through, the, the, the coffee will be fairly uh, brown. So you need to uh, just dump those out. Keep flushing the acorns until the water runs clear, colorless. Taste it. If there's any bitterness in the water, you need to run some more flushes through it. But otherwise, if the water tastes fine, at that point, you have leached all the tannic acid out of your acorns. So what do you do now with them? Well, uh, a number of things. First, uh, what I prefer doing is toasting them before doing anything else. Uh, the main reason for toasting them is it changes the flavor to kind of a roasted nut flavor, which is always awesome. But it also makes it really uh, more brittle. So if I want to grind it for flour, it's that much easier to do. So toasting them, lay them on a cookie sheet, 400 degrees in the oven, a few minutes, and just kind of keep an eye on it. If they turn black, you went too long. Uh, you just want them to turn, you know, kind of a roasted nut sort of color. Take them out, grind them into a flour. Now, oops, and I did it again. Uh, when it is a flour, it is a gluten-free flour. This means you can't make the raised puffy breads, but you can use it to make the assorted flatbreads, you know, tortillas, muffins, pancakes, that sort of thing. Uh, you can also use it to make gravy. You know, just brown it, you know, like flour and thicken it up and away you go. Uh, there has been a number of people who have started making craft beer from ac uh, acorns. 
Uh, I have not had a chance to get any yet, but I'm pretty excited. So hopefully Vista Brewing may be able to do that. And again, I hit the forward switch. I have really big hands and they get in the way of things sometimes. Okay, uh, I notice now that the acorns are falling, so it's a good time to collect them. So acorns, once you leach out the tannic acid, you're really good to go. And they're an excellent source of calories, which is a really good thing to have, especially in a survival food security issue sort of situation. All right. Hey, it's Uncommon Bees. Hey, Mark. Hey, uh, hey Holly. Uh, finding acorns in the tunnel in the star that breaks the old game. Yeah, yeah. Oh, important note. If you work at a place with those really big coffee pots that make like 50 cups at a time, uh, and you go in really early in the morning to leach acorns, do not walk away from them. Because, you know, the fluid looks like coffee. And that can cause career issues. So I'm told. No one can prove a thing. Okay, uh, moving on. Hey, Amanda. Uh, ooh. Okay, Amanda Maloney asking about uh, beer for historical research. I will answer that question. Actually, maybe I can answer it. Uh, ooh, yes, I can. Let me do. Maybe you can see this. Can you see this? Okay, yes. Brewing Local. Excellent book on using all sorts of different wild edible plants for brewing stuff. Okay, and a whole bunch of books fell on the floor, but that's okay. All right, I am not moving fast, but so be it. Okay, uh, Wayne Walker, pick them off the tree or off the ground? Pick the acorns off the tree. Once they fall on the ground, especially if you have a, uh, an acorn weevil in it, uh, the acorn weevil will leave a uh, path for fungus to get in there and cause problems. So, oh uh, yeah, Tom Colbert, factoid, male European, European settlers were 5'4", Native Americans 5'9", uh, mainly because of higher calorie content in the Native Americans' diet. They actually knew what they were doing as far as eating here in this country. And, you know, the more calories you have when you're younger and the more nutrition in general, the better off you'll go and the bigger you'll grow. Uh, in case anyone's wondering, I'm 6'5". Okay. Oh, give us the name of Ellen's book again. It's Backyard Foraging, and uh, it is available from the Amazon store. But let's move on. Okay, hackberry. If you are familiar with the hackberry tree, you probably think it is a trash tree. Oh, Tina, how much protein in an acorn weevil? In my mind, enough to make them worth eating, uh, even without soaking them in tequila first. <laughs> Okay, uh, Rick, uh, question. Green ones or brown ones? If the acorns are dropping from the tree, that means they are ripe and pick them regardless of the color at this point. They've pretty much maximized their growth potential at that point, so they'll have the highest content of fats and oils and the calories and the stuff you're after. Okay, hackberry trees. I love the hackberry trees. Everyone reading, watching, listening right now owes their existence to the hackberry tree. So let me ex uh, explain. Uh, so the hackberry trees, most people, like I said, who have them in the yards consider them a trash tree. They are short-lived, they are messy, uh, the slightest breeze, they're gonna drop leaves and seeds and you know, branches and everything. Most people hate them. They don't realize, like I said, we owe our existence to the hackberry. Now, the Interesting thing, so actually, let's go back. The why do we owe our history to the hackberry? Well, the interesting thing about hackberries is they are the oldest known foraged foods that we can actually point to and say, um, these were eaten by our ancestors. And when I say ancestors, I'm not just talking earlier Homo sapiens, I'm talking farther back than that. Uh, Peking man, the pre-Homo sapien, uh, the series of skeletons found in a cave in central China in the 70s were found with some uh, collections of hackberry berries and seeds. So we can even see our ancestors, not Homo sapiens, but the people before the Homo sapiens were eating the hackberry berries. Now, why were they eating the hackberry berries? Well, first, they were plentiful if there's hackberry trees around. If you have a hackberry tree, you know there's lots and lots and lots of berries, and each one is more than willing to make a tree that wants to ruin your lawnmower. The, if you've ever actually tried one of the berries, you will find that it has a sweet outer pulp, 
surrounding an extremely hard seed. Now, that sweet outer pulp is a source of sugar, which is a source of calories, which is a source of life, especially when you don't know where your next source of calories are coming from. The cool thing, though, is if you have a hackberry around, you do know where your next source of calories is coming from. It's coming from the seed. Now, the, where, the place you get calories from in the wild are nuts, tubers, seeds, and animal fat. And the problem with all of those is they are very seasonable, seasonal, or they go rancid. So animal fats spoils fairly quickly. Uh, a lot of the nuts, if you've ever had pecans or acorns or walnuts or anything sitting out on your, you know, your kitchen or out in your garage or something like that, the oils in them go rancid. Uh, relatively quickly. They, they're what's called oxidizing chemicals. So they react with oxygen and they turn into basically rancid butter and are no longer edible. So the hackberry seed, the oils in it, however, are one of the few uh, berries, if not the, or really the only nut oil that doesn't oxidize. It does not turn rancid. So it was one of the few storable sources of food that humans and pre-humans actually could store. Uh, once the hackberries are ripe, they would you know, basically cut down the tree, collect all this, the, 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 the berries and mash them up into a paste. So the pulp and the seed itself, mash it into a paste, form it into a bar, toast it by the fire and basically make a huge collection of hard granola bars that would then serve them well uh, you know, they could store, and as long as the other animals didn't get into them, they had a storable source of calories, which gave them some comfort in their food security. Huh. Food security. Big deal. Question from Stefan D. Jenick. A dendrologist told me there are no hackberries in Texas, only sugarberry. Your thoughts? Um... The sugar hackberry is the Celtis species. There is a number of native uh, Celtis species here in Texas, which all fall under the hackberry. Uh, there's a really good one out in the uh, West Texas, the desert hackberry too, uh, that has even sweeter berries, but the seeds themselves aren't as oil rich. Okay, so uh, other things you can do with the hackberries, if you mash them up and really a mortar and pestle or you know two rocks works best, your basic Walmart coffee grinder isn't going to be able to break up the seeds. But if you mash them up, uh, you can then boil them and make a substitute almond milk. But in this case, it's a hackberry milk. But if you leave the pulp on, it will have a nice sweet flavor and the protein and the water-soluble fats that, you know, there are many water-soluble fats, but you mix it all up and you have a hackberry milk sort of thing, which is pretty cool. Okay, um, Okay. any other questions on the hackberries? Where you find these uh, really everywhere? One of the things cities like to plant them because they are pretty resistant to pollution and droughts and bad weather other than branches falling them down. Ooh, Ellen tapped in, infusing vodka with hackberries. Uh, I suspect, Ellen, that would be an excellent thing to do. Uh, Stephanie Walker asked, the berries on all the colors of one tree or across different species? The berries, all those colors on one tree. Okay, so the hackberry berries, they start out green and then they ripen into a dark red color. The desert hackberry is a slightly more orange color, but they're all different shades of the red. And remember, if you go to the Foraging Texas website, www.foragingtexas.com, and scroll down to Hackberry, you'll get all sorts of good descriptions, the leaves and everything you need to identify the trees. Uh, Alicia Bloodsworth, is all this found in your book? Um, I, yeah, I believe the Hackberry is in it. Um, a lot of this is, uh, just to throw it out there though, the book only covers 70 plants. The Foraging Texas website currently covers over 200, uh, 200 and I have approximately 70 more I need to add. So, but the book uh, does cover 70 of some of the most common, easy to find, easy to use wild edible plants out there. So it's still worth uh, getting. And I can say this because it doesn't really give me any financial incentive. 
the way f forging, uh, sorry, Idiot's Guides works is the author doesn't get royalties from it. I get a one-time check and nothing, you know, so if a million copies get sold, great for the publisher, doesn't do anything for me. Okay, do, 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 do. when would you pick Hackberry? When they are red. Uh, so how they look in the picture here is when you want to pick them. Okay, next up, the cedar juniper, in particular the Texas cedar. Uh, multiple useful. This is, again, more of a flavoring uh, plant than any good source of calories. But like I said earlier, the flavor is a big part for when you have the same food over and over and over again. If you've ever had a cedar plank salmon, then you know the cedar can actually infuse a nice flavor into your meat. Um, it's a little tricky getting just the right amount. That's why usually with the wood, they soak it with water some so that it doesn't release some of the heavier, uh, more oily oils to it. Um, the leaves, in my opinion, work really well for infusing meat just because they don't have as much of the oils, but they still have a fair amount of flavor and odor that gets into it. But it is something that does require some experimentation. The berries are uh, kind of interesting. If you're out in East Texas, the berries, uh, the red cedar, the Virginia cedar out that way are actually sweet and fairly palatable as is. The hill country cedars, however, they are not as sweet and they have kind of a resiny sort of flavor which is good for infusing vinegar. One of the things I do, uh, I make my own sort of uh, apple cider vinegar, uh, turn it into a poor man's balsamic vinegar by adding uh, juniper leaves, juniper berries, and juniper wood to the apple cider vinegar and let it just infuse for a number of weeks and give it that cedar flavor, which has a really good you know, dash on pasta and salads and wherever you would use a balsamic vinegar. But the other useful thing about the berries is if you've ever looked closely at the berries and touched them, you notice they're coated with a gray powder. And this powder is actually a wild yeast, which means you have a source of fermentation. Uh, you can use it to convert other sugary things, say hackberry, uh, into an alcoholic drink. It won't be a very potent one. The yeast probably will die out by the time the alcohol reaches 5%, um, but still 5% alcohol is better than no percent alcohol, in my opinion. The uh, Another thing you can do is uh, use them for a sourdough starter, where you take a bunch of the berries and mix them with just flour and water and let it sit. And every day you take out a cup of flour, you know, from the, 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 the culture and add a, a fresh cup of water and, and flour to it. And just until it starts bubbling and the yeast reproduces enough to start making that sourdough dough uh, that's so useful and flavorable. Uh, I did see someone mentioned Thujone. Ah, uh, yeah, Jonathan McBride. Now, the Thujone, uh, if you're familiar with Thujone, that is the active ingredient in absinthe, uh, a very popular alcoholic drink uh, back amongst poets and many other artistic -y type people. The belief was that absinthe makes you hallucinate. Uh, actually, it doesn't. What the thujone does is it interferes with your body's enzymes responsible for breaking down the ethanol. The end result then is you have more ethanol flowing through your system. So you, I don't know if suffer the, you know, the, the effects of ethanol more strongly because you, you know, are taking more into your, or more is flowing through your blood rather than being broken down right away. So the end result is you just get a lot drunker. Now, the issue, though, is the Texas cedar, the one in the hill country, does not have that thujone. Only the East Texas cedar does. Okay, sweet. Awesome about the East. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, Austin Morris, sourdough starter. The Like I said, the juniper berries are a great source of yeast. Kevin Rust, to break out the still. Shh. Uh, do, do, do. Any other questions? 
And like I said, there is a time lag, so I will see things, they'll show up about three seconds after I say them. Um, most people would use that as a filter, but eh, whatever. Okay, so cedar, mainly the leaves and wood as seasoning, the berries as seasoning, and a source of yeast. Okay, moving on, and I'm going to take a quick drink here. Okay, the mesquites and the honey mesquite in particular. There's a lot of mesquite out there, but uh, there's multiple things you can do with it. So the flowers uh, in the springtime when they're raw, you can eat those. You can make a tea out of them. Uh, okay, Nikki is asking antifungal, antimicrobial. That will be under the medicinal presentation of Meriwether's World at a later date. Uh, just for the people showing up late, uh, this presentation, I'm just going to talk about the edible uh, virtues of these plants. They will be a different presentation on medicinal, because if I'm doing this every week, I need <laughs> topics. Oops, and I jumped ahead again. Okay, so back to the mesquite. Uh, so the flowers, just using those, uh, like I said, raw. Um, raw, eh, they're okay. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad. It's kind of variable. The, remember, these... Wild plants haven't been selectively bred to be pleasing to our palate. So every once in a while, you may get one that's a little funky. Um, but I will throw them, cook them fairly often. The young seed pods, uh, when they still look like young green beans, kind of flat, a uh, number of people mash them up. They start producing sugar. And there's a lot of things like uh, seed pod jelly, seed pod tea, seed pod alcohol. Uh, different things that you can do with the, the sugar that's starting to form in the honey mesquite. Um, the mature seeds, those are a good source of protein. Uh, they're a seed, they're a bean seed. The issue is they are extremely hard, and so grinding them up can be difficult. Um, there used to be different farmer's markets around where you would show up with a bag of mesquite pods, and swap them out for a freshly ground bag of, of mesquite pods. And then the grinder with the big industrial uh, mesquite grinder would take your, your pods, grind them up for the next customer. Um, I don't know how many of them are around. And if anyone uh, knows of any, please let me know, because that's information I'd like to share for the people in the hill country, you know, where they can take their mesquite pods, their mature mesquite pods to grind them into flour. Okay, like uh, other wild flowers, the mesquite bean flower will be gluten-free again, so you're not going to be able to make the raised breads, but it has all the other uses of the gravy and the flatbreads and things of that nature. The coffee. Now, here's a thing. Whenever you hear a, talk, a forager talking about coffee, what they're talking about is a hot brown bitter fluid. Usually not any caffeine in it, usually not really coffee flavored, just hot, brown, and bitter. And that's the same with the mesquite. Now, I throw enough sugar and stuff in there, it's all right. But even by itself, I like bitter things, so I find it fairly acceptable. But in general, most people aren't all that impressed with it. Unless, you know, the zombies have wiped out H-E-B and Kroger and Starbucks and they're desperate for something hot, brown, and bitter. Okay. Oh, something that isn't on here but uh, recently learned is the mesquite sap. The mesquite sap, if you damage the tree, it oozes kind of a sticky, viscous sap. And it actually has a fairly high sugar content, too, that you can suck on and boil and do other things to extract the sugar. Uh, ba -bum -ba -bum. Kevin Russ, no mesquite here. Does the same apply to honey locusts? In the case of honey locusts, I recommend going to the honey locust post on the www.foragingtexas.com website. But in a nutshell, yeah, the pods of the honey locust have a great deal of brown, gooey, sweet, honey sort of goo in them that it can be used. Uh, Amanda Malone, how long before these seeds go rancid? Uh, a number of months, uh, because they are dry bean, they do last longer. But the thing is, they have a lot of protein, but they don't have the oils. And the oils are one of the key things the body needs as a nutrient, because that's the fats. 
Um, oops, and I jumped ahead again. So, um, you know, there's calories, but there's also fats. And you need fats in your diet. Maybe not you know, three Big Macs worth, but in general, you do need fats. And fats are the thing that go rancid the most quickly. Oh, Tracy says she's glad to be catching this live. Hi, Tracy. Glad you made it. Okay. So, again, mesquite flowers raw are cooked, seed pods raw, but I've also seen people boiling them into jelly and, and uh, tea. And then the mature seed pods, again, the pods themselves in between the seeds has a sweet sort of pulp, and then the seeds can be ground into a flower. Uh, Curtis, oh yeah, uh, going back one second to the uh, the mesquite. There's a very important thing you need to know if you are collecting mesquite pods. And thank you, Curtis. The thing to need to know is you need to take them off the tree. Do not pick them off the ground. Uh, studies have shown that uh, a large percentage, and it's it's too high to gamble on, but a high percentage of mesquite pods you know, mature pods that have touched the ground will be infected uh, with a really a deadly uh, fungus that produces a, a flaxotoxin um, that can be deadly. The other thing is even if you take the pod off the tree, you have to look at the pod to make sure there is no borehole in it. There is a beetle that lives in the mesquite pods, and when they exit the pod, it does leave an opening for this fungus to get in there. So... In general, in a healthy society, take the time to look through and check the pods, make sure there's no holes through them and that they haven't touched the ground, just to make sure uh, that you don't have to worry about the fungus, the deadly fungus. Uh, Clarissa, uh, can you make the uh, sap from uh, mesquite into a sweetener? Yes, it's a very thick, hard, sappy sort of material. Uh, usually you'll like cut the tree and then come back the next day or a day later and it will have oozed out. Um, there'll probably be some bugs in it. Bugs are what we call protein in the foraging world. Um, but it does have, it's another source of sweetness. Mm -hmm. Okay, moving on and taking a sip of water. Now let's move into bushes. Wow, uh, we've been 45 minutes and we've made it one quarter of the way through the presentation. I'm seeing a number of weeks uh, coming out of this. But bushes. Let's talk agarita. Agarita is a very distinctive bush up in the hill country and a very wonderful bush. From an edible point of view, what you are after are the berries. The berries have a nice tangy, sweet sort of flavor going on for them uh, and can be eaten raw can be made into a jelly jam, collect them, mash them, throw some cedar berries in them, ferment them into something alcoholic if you're that type of person, and you're good to go. The flowers, you know, you get the flowers uh, before the fruit. They're okay. Um, if you smell them, they have a great honey sort of, of scent to them. And really, the best thing to do with them is what Vista Brewing did. Uh, Earlier this year, Vista Brewing is up in Driftwood. It's uh, between Austin and uh, San Antonio. And they made a beer infused with the agarita flowers to give it that uh, kind of a sweet, fruity flavor. And then they mix it with some of the things to give it uh, kind of a, a sour thing to make a, a, a Belgian-style beer from it. So if you've ever smelled the agarita flowers, yeah, they smell like a rich honey. And so that's what you're after with them is, you know, infusing that honey flavor into different liquids. The berries, you can eat raw. The seeds, eh, they're okay. I usually just spit them out because, you know, we need more agarita bushes. It's not like they're absolutely everywhere up there. Uh, you will see on the slide, I have the root listed. The root is medicinal, and so are the leaves of the plant. So that'll be another presentation. Um, but from the, the drinking side, the root, oh, I wish, yeah, it's out of my reach. Um, but I've tinctured the agarita root. It becomes a kind of a really cool gold yellow color. Uh, pretty bitter, but it works as a good bittering agent in other cocktails. Okay, so the agarita, the flowers used to infuse into drinks, and then the 
berries eat raw or jam jelly wine uh just oh ellen got one cool uh tina marie says feel free to send me all the spit seeds i will actually be up at vista brewing in october doing a medicinal plant class workshop so we will get some uh actually it's past the season for agarita seeds but oh well okay moving on turk's cap uh, this is an awesome Texas plant. The Turk's cap, it's actually a native mallow. Uh, mallow is the hibiscus family. Okra is in the mallow family. Uh, Rosa Sharon is a mallow. Cotton is a mallow. But the Turk's cap is actually a native Texas mallow. Beautiful flowers. Right now we do have the flowers and we also have the fruit forming. The fruit looks like little apples. And down here in the Houston area, they're all over the place, both the flowers yet and the fruit. So what can you eat on this? Well, you can eat the flowers, uh, both the red part and the green calyx. Uh, they both have a nice flavor to them. You can eat those flowers raw. You can also cook with them. You can make tea with them. The Turk's cap, generally the tea isn't going to be as tart as the other hibiscus teas out there, that's a different species of hibiscus, different species of mallow. Um, but you can still make a tea out of these. The trick is when you pick the flowers. And really, they produce sugar in a cyclical fashion during the day. So in the morning, when the sun first comes up, the flowers don't have a whole lot of sugar at all in them. But as the sun climbs, the sugar content does also until about mid-morning the uh, flowers will start having a high concentration of sugar and then it'll drop down during the heat of the day and then in the afternoon again the sugar content will start climbing until about mid-afternoon and then drop down until nightfall um, the trick is to watch the butterflies and the hummingbirds they know when the sugar is there they're going to go get it so if you see the butterflies and the hummingbirds out there swarming your turk's cap that means the berry or the uh, flowers are have the highest sugar content at that time. Uh, my own personal theory is why it works in that cyclical fashion is just during the heat of the day, it's too damn hot for even hummingbirds. So the the flower or you know the flower why waste time producing sugar if there's no one to come and get it. So you know mid morning mid afternoon. Okay, uh, so those are the flowers. The fruit, and if we can go back, let's see if that works. Nope, we'll go back here. Uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the fruit looks like a little tiny apple, and it tastes like a tangy, sweet apple that's really, really, really awesome. Uh, you just eat the fruit part, leave the green, you know, the collar from the fruit behind, and then as you eat it, you will notice approximately five dark seeds those seeds are edible, but I found, again, the seeds are better toasted than raw. Uh, so you can eat these little apples just raw, like I said. Uh, you can also cook them into jam, jelly, wine. Uh, recently, someone posted on my Facebook page some Turk's Cap uh, berry jelly that they made. It looked really, really, really cool. Um, and like any other berry, you could probably make it into a wine, though the sugar content is a little low for that, for the berries. Um, it'd be kind of like making a hard apple cider, really. Okay, so Turk's Cap. Any questions on Turk's Cap? Okay. <laughs> yeah, husbands sometimes get mad at wives. Hey, it's John Mayer. Hey, John. I miss you, John. I used to work with John. He's an awesome dude. Okay, do, do, do. I'll give another few seconds here. But to the end to recap, the flowers and the fruit are the best parts of the Turk's cap. Actually, the young leaves are edible too, especially in the spring. Raw, they're a little tough and fuzzy, but cooked up, they're actually really, really, really good. So treat the Turk's cap young leaves as a spinach substitute, as a cooked spinach substitute. Just use them wherever you would use spinach. They don't shrink up and dis disappear quite as much as a spinach does, so you don't quite need as much. Okay, quick sip here. Wow. All right. It is 8.49. We've been going, well, 49 minutes. 
Uh, next is the Eliagnus species. And there's a number of these. Uh, these are really popular uh, landscaping plants put in by contractors building neighborhoods. Um, the, uh, they're a durable plant. They're a pretty plant. They don't need a lot of care other than pruning, so they just don't get gigantic. What people don't realize, though, is the fruit of the Eliagnus is edible. So the other weird thing is a lot of times they don't even realize these shrubs, you know, these spotted, interesting looking shrubs in their front yard even produce berries. Unlike most plants that put the berries way out at the end so all the animals can find them right away and take them and eat them and disperse the seeds, for some reason the Eliagnus likes to stick its berries uh, at least the, the silver thorns, the ones found in landscaping a lot, like to put their berries deep in the plant. So you actually have to kind of lift up the plant, look around, dig around, and then suddenly you'll see all these berries. I tell people, if you have an Eliagnus, go out before the Super Bowl. So whatever day the Super Bowl is on, go out and just start looking around under your, your Eliagnus shrub to uh, see if there's any small berries. Because these are more of a late winter sort of berry is when they ripen. The flavor, again, is a nice uh, sweet tart, sort of tangy flavor. I actually recommend letting the berries get a little past ripe to increase the sugar content uh, uh, more. So, uh, Jordan Franklin, are these pretty common in the wild in the HC? Uh, actually, these, if you're asking about the Eliagnus, uh, hopefully not. Uh, tonight's uh, topic, these are actually landscaping plants, things that people will have in their yard or can put in their yard to increase the food hidden in their yard. Uh, so with the Eliagnus, again, the berries, and let them get just a little bit overripe. They should be a little smushy. The seed, ooh, I'm dropping down here. Oop, okay, I'm back. The seeds are edible, but again, they're nothing to write home about. I haven't even bothered toasting them. So I really don't have an opinion on them other than go ahead, try it, see what you think. But it's the berries are what you're after. Oh, it's Luke Swenson. Awesome. Luke Swenson is an amazing knife maker. Um, someday I will get a knife from him. I just have to do a lot more of these shows and find you know sponsors that give me money. Uh, anyway, that's neither here nor there. So back to this. Uh, next thing, the Barbados cherry. Now, this is another non-native plant, but it's very common used in landscaping because it's an evergreen plant. It has these really pretty pink flowers, and those flowers show up uh, up to three times a year. And after the flowers, you get these bright red berries. So three times a year, you get a shrub either covered with really pretty flowers or really pretty berries. Now, what's really cool about these berries as they are an amazing source of vitamin C. One berry uh, has enough vitamin C for the average adult male, uh, daily allowance. Uh, one of the things these became known for was as a source of vitamin C for sailors. Uh, there was a push to plant these around the different naval ports around the world where they would grow uh, as just another source of vitamin C. The hill country is still within the range of them. Uh, if you are trying to grow them in the northern part of the hill country or in areas where they get cold, you probably do want to protect them from hard frosts. Uh, my experience is, though, that even if they freeze, if the roots were protected, uh, they will come back. Whoops, sorry. Um, okay. So even a hard freeze, usually the, the plant will survive. It will just take a while to grow back. Um, like I mentioned, the berries, one a day is enough to give you the vitamin C, and they're available up to three times a year on a healthy plant. Now, the Barbados cherry is a self-fertile plant, so you only need one of them. But if you do have two or more, you will get an even larger uh, production of berries. So really, if you can, squeeze a second one in your landscaping. So the Barbados cherry, the berry is an excellent source of vitamin C and a pretty good flavor. Okay. Yep. One berry a day keeps scurvy away. 
Uh, looking, looking. Okay, moving on. Texas Purple Sage. Ooh, we got five minutes left. So I think this will be the last one we talk about, which is uh, kind of appropriate. The Purple Sage. What you are after in this case are the leaves. Um, this is not a true sage, but it was given its name because the flavor and a lot of the chemical compounds in the leaves of the uh, purple sage plants have the same flavor and uh, some of the same uses as regular culinary uh, sage. I will tell you right now, a feral hog and purple sage sausage washed down with a Shiner Bock is really super Texan. Uh, especially if you're out under the stars at night consuming these. So the leaves you can make into a tea, but really the seasoning, use it as a replacement for sage in your kitchen, uh, is really my preferred use. Um, I recommend tasting a few of the leaves first. The, the initial flavor is very sage-like then it has a slight non-sage-like, like if sage, you know, went down to Texas sort of flavor. So not hot, spicy, anything like that, but just a little different, but still really good. So try it first and kind of adjust your, you know, the recipes to accommodate your purple sage. A uh, really good plant. The leave, or sorry, the flowers uh, with them, I don't recommend uh, eating them. There's no poisons or toxicity or anything like that. It's just they're really pretty. They only show up, you know, and associated with rains and the bees love them. And I really think we should give the bees all the help they can get. Okay, even though we have a lot more plants, I guess this tonight was just part one and the coming weeks will be part two and so forth. So at this point, let me go back to me. Okay, wow, we covered a lot of stuff. Uh, kind of drinking from a fire hose. Uh, sorry about that, but there's a lot of information out there because there's a lot of edible plants out there and there's a lot of food and drink and seasonings and all these wonderful things you can have in your yard, which is a good thing to do. Um, let me say one thing about another book. Oh, I see someone sneaking in. I think there's someone that wants to say hi. Do you want to say hi? Apparently, she doesn't want to say hi. Or does she? I can't tell. Um, come in or not. <laughs> Again, this is my older daughter, uh, Minnie Weather. Uh, cool thing about her. Uh, she is the illustrator for the uh, medicinal plant book that I'm, I'm writing. This is just the pamphlets that I had in doubt that uh, created... Um, at the uh, for the different medicinal workshops, but uh, <laughs> she thinks I'm silly at best. At best. At yeah. best. Okay, but hey, okay. Uh, what I wanted to get to also though is just a quick word about edible landscaping again. And sure, you can do the uh, you know flower beds and traditional island sort of landscaping. My personal preference is what's called permaculture, where you create a complete ecosystem out of edible plants. And a book I recommend for that is Gaia's Garden, second edition. It gives you an introduction on how to set up these ecosystems. Um, and this book is available from the sponsor, who is me. The Amazon Com Shop Foraging Texas. Okay, we are down to one minute. Uh, wow, what an evening. I can't, this goes by so fast. Um, let me know if you liked this format. Uh, I like interacting with people more, and there was something about the PowerPoint that mm, wasn't sure if that was a thing, but on the other hand, there's the information. So, you know, hit me up, drop me a line, let me know what you thought, if uh, this is the way we should do things or what. Um, other than that, wow, I probably don't even have term, time for words of wisdom other than the best thing to remember is whether it's good or bad, this too shall pass. 
and I mean, it may pass like a kidney stone, but this too shall pass, so just wait. All right, well, <laughs> oh, and there we are, nine o'clock. I need to shut this down so that the family can eat. All right, good night all. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great time.